we'll get started in about 30 seconds while we go live on Facebook. So please keep yourself muted. All right, so welcome everyone. We are STEM Matters. STEM Matters is an organization that's made to engage students from around the world in, in, in discussions, in collaborations, in science, technology, engineering, environment matters, and mathematics. This is a nonprofit registered in the state of Texas. And the goal is that we want to nurture critical and, and analytical thinking skills. We engage, guide, and enable students worldwide to innovate, invent, and deliver quality solutions to contemporary problems. Our goal is to develop research and educational programs that can provide local, regional, national, and global activities to learn, collaborate, and compete for excellent outcomes. We are inspired by many outstanding scientists, like our speaker today, Dr. Irshad Hussain. Many such scientists, engineers, doctors, educators, and researchers help us as mentors to accomplish our goals. Uh, throughout the year, we run many outreach and engagement programs. And in summer, especially, we run some summer camp engagement programs as well. Where focused on students again locally regional and all around the world so today we are happy to host uh, an outstanding speaker researcher friend from pakistan dr Ishad hussain i have uh, known dr Ishad hussain for many years uh, when we met in italy where i was organizing a conference and, and we met there i am Dr. Samir Iqbal, I'm a professor here at University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley in uh, US. I also hail from a, a place in Pakistan, Gujarawala. So Dr. Hussein, he is an accomplished researcher in university in Lahore University of Management Sciences. We have, uh, I have seen his work on nanoparticles for biosensing and drug delivery, which we'll be talking about as well. I, a little bit about the background of uh, Dr. Hussein. He was born and raised in a remote village uh, close to Jhang, Pakistan. He received his early education from uh, District Jhang, a remote place in District Jhang. But he's, he was a hard worker, he was a fighter, he got his uh, intermediate, his bachelor from uh, Multan and got his MSc degree in chemistry from Kaizad University in 93. And he worked for some time in chemistry institutes and then he joined a PhD chemistry program at University of Liverpool. And he finished in 2005 under supervision of uh, Dr. Cooper and Dr. Brust. He has been engaged in many outstanding endeavors in uh, nationally and globally as well. I know he was on sabbatical. He started a program in renewable energy systems uh, at US Pakistan Center for Advanced Studies in Energy uh, recently, but four years ago, correct me if I'm wrong. And, and that's a major endeavor, and he's continuing doing a lot of work in that, in that area. His research is focused on the synthesis of customized metal and metal oxide nanoparticles, and which have huge application areas in diverse areas like uh, biomedical sciences and energy technologies in environment, and, uh, and as well as in, in chemical catalysis applications as well. So before uh, wasting too much time, so let me welcome Dr. Irshad and uh, please, uh, uh, before we go, go there, these are few channels that we maintain. So please uh, subscribe, like, and uh, feel free to share it with your friends. 
I will be sharing this information in the chat as well, where you can just click, go online and, and help support the organization in doing more activities like this. So uh, over to Dr. Irshad, sir, please go on. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to participants from Pakistan and good morning to participants from uh, US and Canada. Uh, I'm really thankful to Professor Samir Iqbal to uh, give me this chance to share some of our work with brilliant students across the globe. Uh, I can see many students who are attending from UK, USA, and even Canada, apart from Pakistan, and probably from Tur Turkey as well. So thank you so much uh, uh, to all of you uh, uh, to uh, attend this talk. As uh, Professor Samir Iqbal has mentioned, I am currently professor of chemistry at uh, LAMS, uh, and I work in a very unique department that is Department of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering. And this is probably the first such department uh, in Pakistan where we have uh, initiated this science enriched engineering programs. Initially, we had uh, only electrical engineering uh, among the engineering disciplines, but now we have chemical engineering program as well. So as Professor Iqbal has mentioned, my research focus is mainly on metal nanoparticles uh, and then using those nanoparticles as building blocks to make new nanostructured materials and then explore the applications in variety of disciplines, uh, especially biomedical science that I will be talking today about the applications of these materials in biosensing and drug delivery. And we also work on applications of these materials in environment catalysis and renewable energy technologies. So here is an outline of my two days lecture. I will start with a simple method that we use for the synthesis of metal nanoparticles or nanoclusters. I will commonly be using this term nanoclusters, which are basically particles which are smaller than two nanometer. So if they are bigger than two nanometer, uh, we will normally call them uh, nanoparticles and nanoclusters when their size is smaller than two nanometer. Then I will talk about the applications of these materials in biosensing, drug or gene delivery, uh, to improve the bioavailability and pharmacokinetics of different drugs. And finally, the applications of these uh, nanomaterials to address multi-drug resistance in bacteria. Uh, I normally start my lecture with this slide that I really love because all my work is related to uh, customized synthesis of uh, nanoparticles with decent control over their size, shape, and surface chemistry. We know that there are several biological, chemical, and physical methods that we can use based on top-down or bottom-up approach to prepare these nanoparticles, but the method that we use is very simple and based on bottom-up chemical reduction approach. Uh, in this case, what we do is we start from metal salts and then reduce these metals ions uh, with certain reducing agent uh, into metal atoms. And these metal atoms, they have huge surface energy and due to electrostatic interaction, they would immediately come together to make the smaller nuclei, millions of these nuclei, depending on the concentration of these metal ions in the solution. So if we let these particles grow, 
then definitely they will uh, end up in some macroscopic materials. But in order to make nanoparticles, you really need to control the nucleation, that is the formation of these nuclei, and then further growth of these uh, metal nuclei into nanoparticles. So basically, there are two processes that we need to control. That is nucleation and growth of these nanoparticles. So for example, if we use strong stabilizers or capping agent during the synthesis of these nanoparticles, like those molecules which have, for example, thiol functional group or amine functional group, they will immediately cap these nuclei at very early stage and they will result in the formation of very small particles that we call nanoclusters. But if we let them grow for some time in the presence of weak stabilizers, then they will grow depending on the nature of that stabilizer and the nature of reducing agent to make bigger particles, uh, nanoparticles, in fact. And still these particles, if you carefully look at them, they, they are smaller than uh, 100 nanometers. So that means they have huge surface energy. So in order to minimize their surface energy, they tend to agglomerate. And you really need to use stabilizers, which can prevent the aggregation of these nanoparticles into macroscopic materials. And for this purpose, we normally use two different approaches to stabilize these nanoparticles. One way to stabilize these particles is to coat them with charged molecules which have either positive charge or negative charge. And once those molecules are at the surface of nanoparticles, all these particles will have similar charge. For example, they will have negative charge in the case of sodium citrate. <clears throat> and due to similar charge, these particles will repel each other due to electrostatic repulsion and they will stay away from each other and they will not agglomerate. And this uh, stabilization is normally used when you need to use these particles for applications in biomedical science, because in that case, you would ultimately need to replace these uh, charged molecules with some biomolecules like protein and DNA, and these uh, electrostatically coated molecules, they can easily be replaced with biomolecules. But if you really want to use these, these particles for applications in nano electronics or nano optics in which you really need highly stabilized particles, then you need to covalently attach these long chain molecules uh, to the nanoparticle through covalent linkage. And normally these long chain molecules have thiol or amine functional group at one end. So they will covalently link to this. And once they completely coat the surface of these nanoparticles, then due to their static repulsion, they will, these particles will not agglomerate. And you can basically freeze dry or simply dry these particles and keep them in the form of powder and use them uh, 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 later whenever you want. So they are really extremely stable. Uh, so as I mentioned that uh, you can control the size of these nanoparticles by controlling the nature of ligand or stabilizer that you are using in this case. And we know that thiol is one of the strongest capping agent for metals because it has strong affinity for metals, especially gold and silver and copper. So for this purpose, we, in collaboration with our Chinese collaborators, especially Professor Tan Bian, we designed these kind of polymers which have multiple thiol functional groups, three thiol functional groups. And by controlling the ratio of these polymer to metal uh, ions concentration, we were able to prepare very small nanoparticles of copper, silver, gold, and even platinum and palladium. And the size is usually smaller than two nanometer, depending on how much 
amount of these polymer you use. And depending on the nature of these particles, which are smaller than two nanometer, that we call nanoclusters, they, they, and the nature of ligand on the surface, they can be fluorescent as well. So at the, in this size regime, all these particles, they, they are not behaving as metals, but basically as semiconductor materials. So later what we did is we designed uh, these kind of molecules, which instead of thiol functional group, they have thioether functional group. And the interaction of this thioether with metal particles is slightly weaker than thiol itself. So in this way, we were able to prepare, for example, gold particles ranging in size from one nanometer, two nanometer, three or four nanometer, just in one step by controlling the ratio of gold to polymer. So when we use higher concentration of this polymer, for example, we can end up with smaller particles, which are about one nanometer. So in this way, we were able to prepare gold particles of really uniform size in just one step method using these kind of thioether and functionalized polymers. And remember this, so ether interaction with gold particle is slightly weaker. It can easily be replaced with alkane thiol molecules. Uh, and you can then transfer these particles from aqueous media to organic solvents. So if you carefully note at the structure of this thioether polymer, it has functional uh, box-like functional groups. So, and due to this, these particles are soluble in water but you can tune their solubility and transfer them to organic solvent if you, if you replace these kind of ligands with alkane thiol molecules. And again, they will retain almost the same optical properties of these materials as well. Again, you, if you carefully look at the absorption spectrum of these uh, nanoparticles, initially they have surface plasma and resonance bands when they are about uh, uh, the size which is bigger than two nanometer, but if particle size is smaller than two nanometer, there is no more surface plasma and resonance bands. That means that they are no more acting as metals. Yes, is, is there any question over here? No, I think there was some disturbance. I muted the participant. Please oh, okay. continue. Oh, okay. So in addition to these smaller particles, we also developed various uh, strategies by which simply using weak reducing agents like sodium acrylate, sodium oxalate, or sodium malleate, we were able to prepare gold particles that range in size from 10 to about 100 nanometers. So basically, we developed all these strategies to prepare uh, gold nanoparticles that range in size from 1 to 100 nanometer. And depending on their size, they have different optical properties. For example, these acrylate stabilized particles, they are very similar to state stabilized uh, gold particles, and uh, their size is about 15 nanometer. So they have surface they are extremely red in color, and they absorb uh, uh, at about 520 nanometer. But if you increase their size, then there is a red shift in the absorption, and that absorption of these particles and their color is due to surface plasma and resonance bands that we can discuss over here. So here you can see that by using four different strategies, you can prepare gold particles of different sizes. You can see different color over here. And these color means that these are particles of different sizes. So initially, brown color, for example, they are uh, two nanometer or even smaller than two nanometer. And they don't have any surface plasma and resonance band. But if uh, the size is bigger than two nanometer, they start uh, uh, showing some color 
that could be from this yellowish red to red to purple and finally blue, depending on the size of these particles. And this color is not due to electronic excitation of these particles that we normally observe in different molecules, electronic excitation from HOMO to LUMO. That is because these particles are metallic in na nature and electrons at the surface of these particles, which are bigger than two nanometer, they are oscillating at certain frequency. And they, depending on their size, shape, and surface chemistry, and they would then absorb light of the wavelength that matches with that uh, oscillation frequency. So that is why these particles will absorb at different wavelength depending on their size, shape, and surface chemistry. So here are some of the applications uh, of these gold nanoparticles uh, based on calorimetric detection. So Professor Chad Milken, some of you would know, he is among the pioneers who used these gold nanoparticles and exploited their optical properties to basically introduce a variety of calorimetric methods for the detection of variety of biomolecules. So in this case, what they did is they conjugated this gold nanoparticle, which is about 15 nanometer with DNA molecules uh, that was end functionalized with thiol, for example, simply by incubating uh, gold nanoparticles with thiol functionalized DNA, you can prepare these bio -con conjugates and these DNA gold nanoparticle bioconjugates are really interesting because they retain the optical properties of gold and they retain the recognition properties of DNA. And these are very useful nanoprobes for the detection of variety of uh, biomolecules, in this case, for, for, for example, uh, DNA detection. So in this case, what you see, for example, there are two types of gold particles, A and B, and both are coated with uh, oligonucleotides, which are not complementary to each other. That means the DNA on A, particle A, is unable to recognize DNA on particle B. So when we mix them together, because DNA is not interacting with each other, these particles will stay away from each other and they will remain red in color because their particle size is about 15 nanometer. But if you add a DNA strand that can recognize DNA on particle A and meanwhile it can also recognize DNA on particle B, then this can act as a cross-linker and cross-link these particles, gold particles. And by cross-linking, you can make these DNA-based uh, aggregates of gold nanoparticles. And due to the aggregation, now they change their color from blue, uh, from red to blue. So simply by looking at the change in color that you can see by naked eye, you can say that, yes, this DNA is uh, there. So in this way, you can basically detect different DNA by using this very simple calorimetric assay. And again, these DNA aggregates uh, are simply exploiting the electrostatic interaction between two DNA strands, and that is simply based on hydrogen bonds, you know. And if we look at the melting temperature of simple double stranded DNA, that is not very sharp. That is basically the temperature that will break the hydrogen bonds between two DNA strands and they will separate from each other. So for a simple double stranded DNA, it is not very sharp, but if they're coated, if DNA is coated on these gold nanoparticles, then the melting temperature of this modified, uh, DNA modified, uh, 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 gold nanoparticles, it becomes really very sharp. So by heating these blue aggregates of nanoparticles at certain temperature, you can see a quick change in color. 
into back into red and this melting temperature would basically depend on how many base pairs in the oligonucleotides are matching with each other and by looking at that melting temperature at which these blue aggregates can convert back to red gold particles you can basically detect even different mutations in dna as well so this was really interesting technique that can not only be used for the detection of simple dna but also different mutations in dna as well there has lot lot of work actually that has been done in this regard and recently i was looking into some articles uh, that can be that uh, these nanoparticles can be used for the detection of covid 19 for example and i came across this article uh, that was published in acs nano in that case what they do is they simply take a, a sample from patient isolate rna viral rna rna from the viral particles and then they add to this rna suspension they add gold nanoparticles that are coated with anti sense oligonucleotides which is complementary to the sequence specific sequence of rna in covid 19 and in this way you can basically if they recognize this uh, anti sense oligonucleotide and gold particle can recognize rna from virus then they will they will definitely aggregate and you can see the change in color from red to blue and if you add some rnas to this blue aggregates you can even precipitate gold and particles because it will decompose it will degrade the dna on nanoparticle surface and nanoparticles are no more stabilized by dna so you can see this visual precipitation of gold nanoparticles and by using this very simple assay that you can probably develop methods which can be used for the mass screening of patients for covid uh, infections in yet another case what they did is they functionalized gold nanoparticles with uh, some antibodies that are specific to the protein on viral particles for example Uh, 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 antibodies which are specific to uh, spike and valve and membrane proteins of covid-19 and when they incubated viral particles with these gold nanoparticles these gold nanoparticles attach to viral particles and due to their close uh, distance again they change their color from red to slightly blue and you can clearly see this change red shift in the plasma absorption and these are very simple assays that can probably used to develop calorimetric assays for the detection of covid-19 using uh, gold uh, gold nanoparticles uh, here is a slide from professor rutello who we have been collab collaborating for different uh, projects they developed these gold nanoparticles and coated with organic ligands which have positive charge so these are simply cationic gold nanoparticles that is gold nanoparticles coated with cationic ligands and these can definitely interact with molecules that could be polymers or proteins or even small molecules which have negative charge for example and they can electrostatically make these type of assemblies for example in this case if you incubate these cationic gold nanoparticles with green fluorescent protein which has overall uh, negative negative charge due to electrostatic interaction these proteins will be assembled at the surface of cationic gold nanoparticles and the light which is in, being emitted by these fluorescent proteins that will be absorbed by gold nanoparticle if they are close enough so in this way the fluorescence of these proteins is now quenched and you basically have now 
a nanoprobe that can be used for the detection of different diseases. How? For example, when we have any disease, our body produces a variety of different disease proteins. And these disease proteins, if blood serum from different patients and healthy persons that is incubated with these nanoprobes, the proteins and the blood serum, they will compete with the proteins which are already adsorbed on these cationicol nanoparticles. And if these uh, uh, serum proteins from healthy or diseased patients, if uh, they have stronger negative charge, they will simply kick out already bound green fluorescent protein and their fluorescence will be recovered. And by the quantitative measurement of the recovery of this fluorescence, they, they were able to detect, for example, cancer development of tumors at very early stage. But there were definitely issues related to the sensitivity and specificity of these assays for the detection of uh, different diseases. But because we really don't know exactly at the moment which exact proteins are produced for different type of diseases. So I believe there are certain issues related to the specificity of uh, uh, this assay for the detection of different uh, diseases and that need to be still addressed. They also used these cationic gold nanoparticles for the detection of bacteria, for example. In this case, what they did is they used beta gal protein and they coated these cationic gold nanoparticles with beta gal protein. So once this beta gal huge protein is on nanoparticle surface, it changes its conformation and it basically loses its biological activity and is now unable to convert this yellow substrate into red protein. So, uh, Rishad, there's a couple of questions at this stage, if you are okay to answer as yes, we sure. go. Yeah, so sure. one question has been, uh, how do gold nanoparticles interact with viruses like SARS-CoV-2 in folding? How do how nanoparticles do interact with COVID? With COVID, SARS because those particles were functionalized with antibodies that were specific to the spike proteins of COVID or envelope proteins of COVID. So those protein, anti-protein interaction is very specific. So in that case, they, they would basically assemble on the surface of viral particle. So another question is, what kind of bonding is there between metal nanoparticles and organic molecules? Is it technical so to maintain that? The that that really depends on the nature of organic molecules. As I mentioned, if it is simply the charged molecules like sodium citrate or sodium acrylate, so that is simple electrostatic interaction. But if those molecules have free thiol groups or free amine groups, then thiol can make a, a covalent linkage with metal. So that, then there is a covalent bond between those organic molecules and uh, and uh, gold particles. And, and the, the continuation of the same question that uh, do these, these bonds are maintained or do they get perturbed during the processing? Well, it, it really depends on how do you stabilize your particles. If they are simply stabilized by electrostatic stabilization, then they are not very stable and they would aggregate even if there is minute amount of some electrolyte over there. But if they're covalently stabilized, that you really need for these kind of bioapplications, and I will talk about that, the stability of these particles in some later slides, then mm -hmm. you need to covalently stabilize them with, for example, some peptides. So if they are co uh, covalently functionalized with pep peptides, then they become highly stable. So then they do not aggregate in the presence of electrolytes. Yeah, please continue. So if it's okay, so, as the questions come, I'll post them to you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So in this case, what I was talking about that this beta-gal protein is able to convert this 
yellow substrate in prudent product when it is in free form. But when it is on gold particle, then it loses its catalytic activity. But if it is incubated with, uh, uh, in water containing bacteria, then bacteria has stronger interaction because they have overall negatively charged surface. So then particles which are positively charged, they will interact more with bacteria and this beta gal protein is released. And then it is able to convert yellow substrate into red product. So in this way, you can develop methods, calorimetric method for the detection of bacteria in drinking water. But remember, in this case, you are using gold particles and then you are using proteins for the detection of bacteria, which may not be an attractive method uh, for real applications because both of these, uh, uh, they are expensive and there are stability issues with different proteins as well. And for that purpose, we collaborated with, with Professor Kurutello Group a few years back to exploit the redox applications of magnetic nanoparticles for the same purpose, for the detection of bacteria. And you will be surprised to note that these uh, magnetic iron oxide nanoparticles, they can act as artificial enzymes because they have redox properties that can mimic, for example, a horse reddish peroxidase enzyme. So, if you have, for example, this yellow pyrogalol substrate, it can be converted into red product in the presence of uh, iron oxide nanoparticles in the presence of hydrogen peroxide. And the same actually reaction you, you, you would also note if you use hot reddish peroxidase enzyme instead of iron oxide nanoparticles. But we try to develop these iron oxide nanoparticles, which are which are mimicking that horse reddish peroxidase enzyme, and meanwhile they are coated with organic molecules like dopamine that can interact with bacteria. So the purpose was that if we have iron oxide nanoparticles which have strong interaction with bacteria then you can probably change their redox properties at the surface. And once these particles are coated with bacteria, they may not be able to convert this yellow substrate into red product. So we were basically trying to develop this very simple assay for the detection of bacteria and try to make some uh, uh, test steps for this purpose. But uh, unfortunately, we were not able to improve the sensitivity of this detection assay good enough that it can be applied in uh, 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 in real market to detect bacteria in drinking water. The sensitivity of this method was only to detect about 1,000 bacteria per ml uh, uh, by naked eye, but still it was not that sufficient that it can be used in the field for real applications. And for that purpose, we try to actually design new ligands uh, for, uh, to improve the sensitivity of this method, but we are still not able to make this method sensitive enough for real applications, unfortunately. In another case, what we did is we functionalized these iron oxide nanoparticles with some polymers which are rich in carboxylic groups. And then you can exploit the chemistry of these carboxylic groups to conjugate uh, different drugs, including anti-cancer drugs, for example, doxorubicin, and explore the applications of these magnetic nanoparticles for targeted delivery of different anti-cancer drugs. And in this case, we noticed that these were really very useful carriers to take these doxorubicin like anti cancer drugs to the cancer cells if they are driven by, for example, magnetic field. And we know that these type of magnetic iron oxide nanoparticles, they have really interesting applications, not only for these drug delivery, 
but also for uh, uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. And recently they have been reported to, uh, to be used as artificial spleen that can even remove toxic bacteria and toxic cells from your body by using a machine which is very similar to, to, to the dialysis machine. So I don't want to go into detail, but that is really an interesting article about the use of these iron oxide nanoparticles as artificial spleen to remove pathogenic bacteria from the body. And more recently, these iron oxide nanoparticles, they have also been found to interact with the spike protein of COVID-19. So if you incubate these viral particles, for example, with iron oxide nanoparticles, these iron oxide particles interact with the spike protein, and now this becomes unable to infect cells because it cannot then interact with the receptors, ACE2 receptor on the surface of the cells, and they cannot be endocytos in the uh, in the cell. So people are really trying to develop different type of technologies based on these nanoparticles, which can be used not only for the detection of viruses, but also for the treatment as well. Uh, here is the cartoon that I normally show in my lectures, basically to highlight the applications of uh, these materials, especially gold nanoparticles, gold nanorods, and gold nanoshells for phototherapy applications. So in this case, what is happening, uh, this is just a cartoon, please note. This experiment has probably not yet been done on humans, but uh, at mice level. So what they are doing is, is, for example, in this cartoon, you inject about 25 nanometer gold particles in the blood vessels. And once they are injected in blood vessel, particle size is about 25 nanometer, whereas the pore size of these blood vessel is about five to 10 nanometer. So they cannot normally go out of these blood vessels. So after passing through this liver, they can basically move throughout the body in these blood vessels. And if they find any leaky blood vessels, like this one, where there is a developing tumor, because developing tumor requires more nutrients and blood vessels in that uh, region become leaky. Their pore size increases uh, in a process that we call angiogenesis. And once these particles find these bigger pores, they come out of these blood vessels and they accumulate and in that region. And if they're accumulated in that region, these particles are bigger and enough that they can absorb uh, NIR radiations. So these uh, animals can then be radi radiated or scanned with NIR camera, and you can detect where these particles are accumulated. And so if you... uh, there are a couple of questions related to the topic you're talking about. So if I can, uh, so one yes. question is, so does size of nanoparticle matter in detection of biomaterials like germs and bacteria? Well, in this case, for example, uh, you are talking about magnetic iron oxide nanoparticles. So definitely the properties of these magnetic nanoparticles, they would certainly depend on uh, their size. So if they are bigger enough, they would be highly magnetic and it may not be easier to stabilize them because due to their magnetic interaction, they, they will basically uh, uh, interact with each other. So what the particle size that we use uh, in our purpose, that was smaller than even five nanometer. So they were smaller enough so that they, they have weak magnetic properties uh, for the detection of bacteria. But depending on the applications of these magnetic nanoparticles, you definitely need to use particles which are of different sizes. In some cases, you need to exploit the magnetic properties of these materials. Then they definitely need to be more magnetic and their size can be bigger. Another question is that, can we target gold nanoparticles to bacteria biofilms 
to prevent the growth of bacteria over chronic bounds for diabetic wounds and ulcer okay, treatment. That, actually, my last few slides will focus on this topic that is about multi-drug resistance. And in that cases, we have not yet used gold, part gold particles themselves because silver is more kind of uh, uh, attractive material to kill bacteria at the moment. So we used uh, silver uh, nanoparticles of different sizes. Uh, for example, particles which were about two nanometer and 10 nanometer silver particles. And then we noticed how they can basically kill the bacteria which are hidden in the biofilm. So that I will discuss in my last slides. All right, very good. Yeah, please continue. Yeah, thank you. So in this case, I was saying that these uh, developing tumors can be detected at very early stage using these gold particles. Uh, and then if you uh, increase the dose of NIR radiations, you can increase the localized temperature and you can uh, basically kill the cancer cells as well. So these nanoparticles are nano shells. They can actually be considered as nano robots that can not only detect a developing tumor at very early stage, but uh, they can kill the cancer cells as well. But it is very easy to say such type of uh, things, but it is very difficult to design particles for these type of applications because our immune system will also play a very important role when you inject these foreign particles in the body. So for that purpose, normally these gold particles or any other uh, nanoparticles, they are usually coated with hydrophilic molecules like polyethylene glycol. So that when, when they are injected, there is a drop of water around these nanoparticles and your immune system assumes that it is not any foreign particle, but just a droplet of water that is, uh, that is moving in the body. So in this way, you have to basically uh, design these materials very specifically so that they can, expect, they can escape the immune system as well. Uh, so these particles, gold particles or other metal or metal oxide nanoparticles, they're being exploited uh, uh, for different drug uh, delivery applications. And remember that these metal or metal oxide nanoparticles, they are usually not degradable. So there are certainly issues associated with their toxicity. So people are now nowadays interested to develop materials which can which contain minimum amount of these inorganic materials like gold or iron oxide or whatever. And they can uh, conjugate more number of drug molecules these, to these nanoparticles. And for that purpose, you probably need particles which are of the same size, but they are porous in nature so that they have higher surface area and you can attach more drug molecules per particle. So for this purpose, we have basically developed several strategies, one-step strategies uh, are sometimes the self-assembly approaches uh, on primate gold particles especially to make particle assemblies which have higher surface area and they have uh, potential applications for targeted delivery of different type of drugs. And here are just images of some of these uh, nanoparticle assemblies that we have either in just one step method, or we have confined, for example, in this case, we confined gold particles in emulsions and then cross linked uh, by a, a certain cross linkers within those emulsions. And depending on the size of emulsions, we are able to control the size of these gold nanoparticle assemblies as well. So these are really interesting assemblies of uh, uh, gold particles that may be used for different uh, applications for targeted delivery of anti-cancer drugs. So uh, uh, as I mentioned there, there are issues related to the toxicity of these uh, metal and metal oxide 
nanoparticles. So we also try to explore the applications of some, uh, for example, biopolymer-based nanoparticles. So for uh, uh, to improve the bioavailability and pharmacokinetics of different drugs. For example, in this case, we develop lecithin-based nanoparticles are liposomes. Lecithin is a biosurfactant or ramnolipid, which is basically abundantly av available in our body. So it is uh, highly biocompatible. So we developed these lecithin-based nanoparticles and liso liposomes, and then encapsulate amphotericin B, which is basically anti-leshmenial drug to improve its bioavailability and pharmacokinetics. And we were really uh, excited to note that encapsulating amphotericin B in uh, these type of uh, lecithin-based nanoparticles, we were able to enhance the bioavailability of amphotericin B. Here is the structure of this amphotericin B molecule, uh, which is anti-leshmenial. And we were able to increase uh, the bioavailability up to 20 times in this case. And similarly, the efficacy uh, of this uh, uh, amphotericin was also significantly enhanced. In second case, what we did, in addition to this lecithin, we also incorporated some gold nanoparticles to improve the anti-inflammatory effect of diacerin. We know that diacerin is anti inflammatory drug, and so are gold nanoparticles. Gold nanoparticles are also reported to have anti-inflammatory effect. So in this case, we combine gold nanoparticles and amphotericin B in these organic nanoparticles, and we noticed again that the, bio, the oral bioavailability of this diacerin was improved by five times in this case, and there was significance significant enhancement in the efficacy of uh, this diacerin as uh, due to synergistic effect of gold nanoparticles and this anti-inflammatory drug. In yet another case, we designed the, these uh, chitosine-based gold nanoparticles and encapsulate gold nanoparticles as well as liposomes and encapsulated different drugs in the hydrophilic interior of these liposomes. And then we functionalize these liposomes with folic acid to make them more specific for, uh, uh, for cancer cells, for example. And again, we were able to improve the bioavailability and efficacy of uh, anti-cancer drugs using these chitosine coated with folic acid kind of functional groups. So this work was again done in collaboration with uh, uh, some colleagues at Kadyazm University. Uh, we also designed and developed these kind of microporous organic polymers, which were hollow in nature. So in this case, what we did, we initially used silica nanoparticles as sacrificial templates and then grow these porous polymer around, around that by emulsion polymerization. And finally, you can remove the silica nanoparticles by etching and produce these hollow polymer nanoparticles, which are microporous in nature. And then you can uh, functionalize these with different anti-cancer drugs to improve the bioavailability and pharmacokinetics of these kind of drugs. And recently, these kind of uh, nanoparticles and liposomes have also been used by some groups to, for example, improve the efficiency of ivermectin uh, drug, which is uh, FDA-approved antiviral drug. So once it is encapsulated in some nanoparticles, for example, that are coated with FC immunoglobin uh, fragment, then this drug encapsulated a nano uh, particle was able to inhibit or decrease the expression of viral spike protein and is to uh, receptor so in this way uh, so if uh, spike proteins are inhibited or 
PH2 inhibitor is inhibited, then these viral uh, particles, they cannot infect, they cannot enter the cell, basically. So these kind of formulations are being uh, evaluated currently to treat COVID infections as well. And recently, people have encapsulated, for example, dexamethasone, which is again being evaluated as anti-COVID-19 drug. They encapsulated this drug within the hydrophilic interior of uh, these kind of liposomes and significantly enhanced the bioavailability and pharmacokinetics of these materials. So these kind of liposomes, uh, especially organic based nanoparticles and liposomes of biocompatible surfactants, they are really commonly being used to enhance the bioavailability of different type of drugs. And many formulations are currently FDA approved, especially for cancer as well. You might have heard of Doxil, which is basically liposomal based anti-cancer drug, Doxil V6. So these kind of uh, uh, formulations, they have really interesting applications to enhance the bioavailability and efficacy of different type of drugs. Recently, we also reviewed the use of these uh, liposomes for the delivery of, for example, SIRNA through uh, uh, nas nasal, for example, based formulations. So this article we just recently published in NanoSelect, in which we actually highlighted the potential role of these liposomes to deliver SIR, SIRNA to the lungs, where they can probably interact with viral genome and break that down so that they, it, it is unable to replicate further. So this was just an article recently published from our group. Uh, another strategy that people are using uh, uh, to address, uh, to basically treat COVID infection is to use nitric oxide releasing uh, nanoparticles for that purpose. Nitric oxide, you might know that is a free radical gas and really play a very important role in biological systems, especially to control cell communication, vasodilation, to control blood pressure, wound healing, and it has also been used as antiviral and antimicrobial agent as well. So in addition to oxygen, different doctors, doctors they have tried to give controlled dose of nitric oxide to treat COVID serious patients. And they got really interesting results. So that is why people are now trying to explore nanoparticles that can deliver these nitric oxide uh, uh, carriers like this S nitroso succinex acid, for example. It can be loaded in nanoparticles, delivered to the uh, lungs over there, and then you can uh, release nitric oxide by certain internal or external stimuli to basically treat those COVID-infected cells. I'm sure you might be aware of gene therapy. So gene, in gene therapy, what happens, in tra traditionally what we do is traditional drugs, they would basically interact with diseased proteins to make them inactive. But you can basically stop the translation of messenger RNA to these diseased proteins if you can bind these messenger RNA with antisensory oligonucleotides. But problem of sending these antisensory oligonucleotides to, to the cell is a real problem because they are not very stable. So they get degraded very quickly once they are injected in the body. So you really need to help carriers that can safely deliver these kind of antisensory oligonucleotides to the region where they are desired to send them into the nuclei where they can combine with the messenger RNA. And for this purpose, uh, gold nanoparticles have really been found to be useful for that, that purpose. And in this case, these 
uh, oligonucleotides which were functionalized initially in the thiol group, they were coated on gold nanoparticles. And due to complementarity effect of these uh, oligonucleotides, when they're closer to each other, they become much more stable compared to when uh, they were independent. So in this way, they were able to basically deliver siRNA to, to the cell without their degradation and you do the useful job over there. And even more recently, this has been done, for example, uh, by functionalizing gold nanoparticles with DNA initially, and then adding cross-linking DNA over there to make gold nanoflas. And these gold nanoflas can again be used for the delivery of uh, siRNA to, to, uh, to, to the cells. And then again, you can control the surface chemistry of these kind of uh, nanoflars so that they are delivered to the region where they are desired. And once you deliver these kind of drugs or even oligonucleotides to the region where they are desired, then there are issues related to the release from the carriers as well. And for that purpose, uh, scientists basically design different strategies that are based on the internal or external stimuli that can trigger the release of these kind of drugs or oligonucleotides. For example, in this case, Professor Rupila group, they designed these kind of photolabile organic ligands which have this ester group. And these photolabile ligands, they are ketanic in nature, so they can carry oligonucleotides in the cells, and once they are delivered in the cells, then you can radiate this with UV laser quickly to break this ester bond and control the release of oligonucleotides within the cells. So in this way, there are various strategies that are commonly used for the control release of this drug as well as oligonucleotides within the cells as well. Uh, as we were talking about the stability of these nanoparticles, that is really important. As I mentioned in the, in the beginning, if they are electrostatically stabilized, the gold particles, they are not very stable. Uh, and they will immediately agglomerate in the presence of minute amount of electrolytes like sodium chloride. And uh, definitely in the blood, they will immediately agglomerate. And for that purpose, we screen different peptides that have uh, cysteine residue at one end so that they can covalently link with gold nanoparticles. And that we found uh, Professor Levi, basically, we were working in collaboration with him at the University of Liverpool, and we found that this calm peptide basically gives extra stability to these nanoparticles, and they become so much stable that they can even withstand sodium chloride concentration of up to uh, three, four molar concentration of sodium chloride, which is really huge. Otherwise, they, they cannot even withstand few uh, micromoles of these uh, sodium electrolyte concentration, basically. And once they are coated uh, with calm peptide, they can simply be purified using, for example, gel chromatography as well, and they do not agglomerate. Uh, and you can exploit again the rich chemistry of these peptides to conjugate uh, different proteins as well as uh, different uh, uh, drugs, including anti cancer drugs, to these nanoparticles and then use them for different type of uh, applications. So, this was definitely a versatile kind of uh, protein like gold nanoparticles, which can be for variety of applications in biomedical science. Uh, as I was talking about that, we are also using some of these nanoparticles that we are developing to address multi-drug resistance as well. You know that bacteria develop resistance against uh, antibiotics very quickly these days. And that is why many drug companies, they are hesitant to develop new antibiotics. Uh, but these 
uh, inorganic materials, they are really hope in this regard these days because they can kill bacteria by exploiting multiple mechanisms, by physically damaging the cell membrane, for example, uh, of these cells, and then uh, uh, releasing some reactive oxygen species that can kill bacteria and viruses. And for that purpose, we have been designing uh, different kind of nanoparticles, especially silver nanoparticles, and try to control their surface chemistry. Uh, for example, in this case, what we did is we prepared these two nanometer silver nanoclusters, which were positively charged due to presence of uh, positively charged polyethylene imine, PEI polymer. So this PEI coated silver nanoparticles, they were really useful to kill different strains, europathogenic strains, which were otherwise different, difficult to be killed by different antibiotics. So they were basically multi-drug resistant. But in the presence of these titanic silver nanoclusters, we were able to kill about, I remember, 12 different strains, europathogenic strains, which were multi-drug resistant. And these confocal images you, you can see over here, these are basically bacteria which are live bacteria or dead bacteria which are labeled with different fluorescent proteins. Uh, and uh, for example, this green fluorescent protein is due to uh, some fluorescent molecules which can only get into live bacteria. Uh, so if bacteria are dead, so then uh, this the cell wall or cell membrane can become porous and then other uh, fluorescent proteins can also get into this. So fluorescent of, you can use different fluorescent molecules which can get into live cells or dead cells in a different ways. And simply by labeling with those dyes, you can detect bacteria whether they are dead or they are alive. And in another experiment we used these very recently, silver 44 nanoclusters. As I mentioned before, that optical properties of these nanoparticles that really depends on the size and surface chemistry of these nanoparticles. And in this case, we designed these silver 44 nanoclusters, which were atomically mono, mono dispersed. That means each nanocluster of silver will have 44 atoms of silver. And they are not metallic in this size regime. They are basically semiconductor in nature. And we were basically trying to explore their applications in solar cell technology to, to use them as sensitizer uh, to harvest sunlight, for example, because they absorb major portion of sunlight in UV region a visible region as well as in NIR region. And we recently tested them to kill some uh, multi-drug resistant bacteria as well in collaboration with Professor Antonis Kenaras at the University of Southampton. And we found that they're really effi very efficient to kill multi-drug resistant bacteria that is Neisseria gonorrhea, which is otherwise very difficult to kill with traditional antibiotics. And the concentration that is required to kill these bacteria, that is not very high. And at concentration which are not toxic to the mammalian cells, we were able to kill these multi resistant bacteria using the silver 44 nanoclusters. And here is what uh, one of the participants was asking about the role of these nanoparticles to kill bacteria when they hide themselves in biofilms. We know that if bacteria are hidden in the biofilm, which is basically biopolymers uh, uh, containing a variety of biomolecules, especially polysaccharides and uh, uh, proteins, then it is very difficult to kill these bacteria. And uh, one of the phenomena that offers strength to this, uh, these kind of biofilm 
that is based on FAPC protein fibrillation. So FAPC protein, for example, it can uh, make fibrils that can give additional strength to the biofilm of bacteria. So we were trying to see how these nanoclusters of silver, which were two nanometer in size, and then silver nanoparticles, which were at 10 nanometer, both having the same surface chemistry. They are coated with, for example, PEI. We were trying to figure out how, if they can inhibit the fibrillation of this protein, which is FAPC, that basically strengthen the biofilm. And we noticed that both of these uh, nanoparticles, basically, they are very effective to inhibit FAPC fibrillation. And uh, finally, these two nanometer clusters, they were found to be more effect cytotoxic, mainly because of uh, the, the higher surface area, for example, and uh, they were able to uh, puncture they were able to rupture, for example, the cell membrane of bacteria and they released a higher concentration of reactive oxygen species compared to larger silver nanoparticles. Uh, so these two nanometer silver nanoclusters were uh, really more effective to kill bacteria, even while they were hiding in the biofilm. But both these particles, whether they are two nanometer or 10 nanometer, they were able to inhibit protein fibrillation in both, both cases. And more recently, we have also tried, so when, whenever you try to design these nanoparticles to kill bacteria, you really need to take uh, into consideration the surface chemistry of uh, those materials as well. For example, we know that whether it is gram-positive bacteria or gram-negative bacteria, both of these bacteria are negatively charged. So if particles are positively charged, they are definitely more effective in this case. So though negatively charged particles can also kill, but they would probably require more concentration of those particles to kill the bacteria. And similarly, by looking at the surface chemistry of this bacteria, their hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity, you can design these particles with controlled hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity, and surface charge so that they can efficiently interact with bacteria. So this is very interesting, simple tutorial review, and I would really recommend you guys to go through this review if you are in, interested to develop materials that can be used to kill uh, uh, bacteria and even viruses. Apart from these type of applications, we have also recently designed uh, these macroporous polymers. This is basically polymer beads in which you can control the chemistry of these polymers. You can control the pore size Let me turn of these polymers, and then you can infiltrate different uh, nanoparticles, in, including silver nanoparticles. And we have used these kind of uh, porous polymers not only to remove organic and inorganic pollutants from water but also to kill bacteria uh, uh, in, uh, in water streams. So this was all about my work related to biomedical applications of these materials. And as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we use these nanoparticles as building blocks to develop a variety of new nanostructured materials. And then in collaboration with our national and international collaborators, we try to explore their applications in a variety of different fields, including renewable energy technologies and nowadays even for uh, energy storage materials, for electrode materials as well. So we are really very open to discussion and collaboration. And if you, any of you have some interesting ideas to use either of these materials for any good applications, I would really be happy to discuss. And finally, uh, I would uh, like to thank uh, all these uh, groups, uh, international funding agencies, uh, different universities abroad in USA, Europe, China, Saudi Arabia, and institutions in Pakistan who have really supported 
our work here and abroad and make all this uh, work possible. And thank you very much, all of you, for listening. So I am now available for any question that you have. Thank you, Dr. Ishad. I do virtual clapping for you. This was really informative and really thought provoking. We do have some questions that were posted in chat. And, and we, of course, the room is open for all participants to ask questions. So maybe you can start now, or maybe you can raise hand and I can invite you to ask questions. Well, please, Dr. Zaman, go ahead. Thanks, Dr. Hussain, uh, for informative and interesting talk. So I learned a lot from your talk. So this is uh, Dr. Tariq Zaman, research professor at Neuroscience, Michigan State University. So for the last two decades, my focus was neurological disorders caused by genetic mutations. So nanoparticles have a much larger biomedical application from MRI to gene delivery to brain tumor. So that's what excited me for this talk. And exciting information from your talk is that we can detect mutations. I hope this can be better achieved in vivo if we combine genetic approaches like iron oxide based nanoparticles imaging in the brain like MRI. If this can work, then can we do means better gene profiling as well like in vivo? So what's your thought on this? that can work so we can make a big change when it comes to gene profiling or mutation detection within the brain. Thank you Dr. Tarek Zaman for attending this lecture. I really appreciate that you spare time for this. Uh, the work that I was presenting about the use of gold nanoparticle and DNA conjugate that is basically the work that was pioneered by Professor Chad Mirkin at Northwestern University. And what they did is basically they exploited the interaction between DNA. For example, uh, to figure out at what temperature they can convert those blue aggregates back to red by breaking the hydrogen bonds between DNA strands. And depending on their complementarity, for example, if they are more complementary they're, if they're completely complementing to each other, DNA on nanoparticle surface, then they would have higher electrostatic interaction and they will melt at higher temperature. But if there are some mutations, then definitely there will be some gaps in the interaction. So hydrogen bars will be lesser compared to fully complementarity. So in that case, you can change the color of those aggregates aggregates of uh, DNA coated gold nanoparticles at lower temperature, for example. And we really have not done much on those type of calorimetric assays. What we have done is to coat these nanoparticles on DNA and then exploit the recognition properties of those DNA to make different assemblies of nanoparticles. So we try to make different assemblies of nanoparticles by exploiting the uh, recognition properties of DNA on nanoparticle surface, but we have not done that uh, to develop any calorimetric cal assay for detection. But definitely there is a potential and uh, we, we can probably explore because we can certainly make those kind of bioconjugates. And with your help, probably we can explore the applications of these bio conjugates in uh, uh, detecting those kind of mutations as well. Yes, so but thanks for answering. at the moment, we, we have not done yet. OK, thanks for answering. Uh, I really appreciate that. So I think uh, there is a potential that we can work and we can actually make something new, like you know, the future is regenerative medicine and personalized medicine. But this is something much more convincing than we have to do, like gene profiling. Uh, and other tissues, it's easy. The brain is the most, uh, you know, yeah. the delicate one. And we have a big challenge. So we can do only in animal models. So if this works, and hopefully it could work in the near future. So that can be a game changer. Yeah, sure. 
again, I, I would like to mention that I am a chemist. So I can certainly talk about chemistry point of view that how can you design these type of materials, but I don't know much about biology side. So we can certainly design those kind of DNA gold nanoparticle conjugates and would be happy to share with you if you want to use. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I think uh, everybody has, uh, you know, different expertise and that is your strength, actually. We don't know that much. So I learned from your uh, thought that we can do genetic mutation detection. So that's uh, that was the uh, information that gave me this opportunity that, oh, we can so do this. What I will do is I will share with you more articles on this. Okay, okay. On the use of these gold nanoparticles for the detection of these DNA mutations. And yeah. then we can probably keep yeah, because discussing. because that's my area of interest. We did a lot more, like 50 variants to, of to, many different to, disorders. Synthesize those. It, but, to make the interaction easy, I have shared the email address of Dr. Irshad in the chat. Please take a screenshot of copy because, you know, when the Zoom meeting ends, the chat goes away. And, and this leads us to the uh, another question. And there are a couple of uh, very good researchers who have shared their, their information in the chat also. Uh, Dr. Uh, okay, Dr. Server, Munaza Server, she has shared her expertise and her email address. There is, there is Dr. Rashid Ahmed from Qatar who has shared his information. So please scroll through the chat and copy the information. We will be happy to share and, and uh, use STEM Matter platform to make connections. I suggest if you have not done so, this is the WhatsApp group link I'm sharing. Please, uh, you can join the WhatsApp as well so we can use that platform to exchange information as well. So our goal is to help make this collaboration possible. If we go further, there are more questions in the chat, but if anybody from the audience wants to ask, please raise your hand or unmute yourself and, and go ahead. So I can see one question from Hira Khaled over here. Yes, sir, go ahead. How does the antibacterial activity depends on the shape and size of them? So as I mentioned in my last slides, that smaller is the particle, usually, they have higher surface area, and uh, they are probably more effective to kill bacteria, smaller size particles. And similarly, if there is any anisotropy, for example, if you have rod-like particles or star-shaped particles with sharp edges, they can probably better damage, they are in a better position to uh, damage the cell membrane and cell wall of these bacteria. So definitely anisotropy and smaller size of these particles that is more helpful to enhance the antibacterial activity of these materials. There is another question which was in the chat. One was the discussed the metal toxicity concerns in using the different types of metallic particles. So I think you, you touched upon that already, but if you want to yeah, can, can you please repeat that question? I was reading the Metal question. toxicity concerns in using different types yeah, yeah, of- Yeah, I, I already talked about this, yeah. that uh, it is just the research which is going on at the moment. So metal particles, if you really want to use for clinical, real clinical applications, you need to figure out their ultimate fate as well. So, and there, there are so many groups currently who are working uh, on the toxicity of these type of materials, if they can be, if they are ultimately used for drug delivery applications, for example. And many people actually believe that the amount of the material that will be used for this purpose, that is really very small. So you are talking about few nanograms of these kind of materials. And if you are doing a targeted delivery, those who are in the favor of this technology, they believe that it may not be much 
are before. If the amount is really small. And again, uh, once they are, for example, in the cells, so then glutathione, which is expressed in a higher amount in the cancer cells, that is helpful to leach down the metal uh, ions from the nanoparticle surface. And in this way, it can slowly be removed from the body as well. So there are so many mechanisms that people are trying to study and understand the fate of these materials. But yes, toxicity is an issue. All right, very good. So I see another question, which was more on comparison of silver nanoparticles and gold nanoparticles with respect to their uh, toxicity. So I think that's also you addressed that which one may be more suitable depending on their chemical interactions, right? So there is a question about the biological synthesis of uh, these uh, nanoparticles. Yes, there has a lot, you will see hundreds of articles on the use of different uh, plant extracts, for example, or bacterial extracts for the synthesis of these nanoparticles, especially from India. Uh, I'm not to be honest, much fan of that because in that case, you cannot really control this size, especially size of these nanoparticles very effectively. People have uh, very oftenly reported uh, the methods by which they can control the shape, for example, they can repair prisms or nanocubes of these nanoparticles using plant extracts, but they certainly have reproducibility issues. Chemical method, on the other hand, in which you use pure uh, chemicals, you know what is in the solution, that is much better to control the size, shape, and surface chemistry compared to the biological methods. I believe. That is my personal kind of thought, opinion. All right, very good. So there are a few more questions. So let me share an announcement before we continue with the question. So we have scheduled another very fantastic talk on coming Sunday. So I'm just share, going to share the slide. This will be Dr. Rajul Huck, who is, uh, who is PhD in mechanical engineering from Purdue University, but now he is uh, doing patent work. So I hope you can see my slide, right? Let me Should I remove sure. the sharing. Yeah, yeah. Let me. I, I just did that so we can just see one slide. Yeah. So, so this would be on 18th of April, Sunday, same time like today. The link will be shared. So we are working on the flyer. So if you uh, if you sign up for the WhatsApp group, you'll get the flyer and the link for this talk also. So that's on Sunday. So let's continue with the with the questions. I think there are a few more questions in the chat, and or if you want to ask, feel free to ask the, the speaker right now. Uh, 